Hello, and welcome to the session on debriefing. My name is Kim Layton, and I'm the Executive Director of the ITCON Clinical Simulation and Innovation Center at Hamad Medical Corporation in Doha, Qatar. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Sager and the course team for including me in the presentations today. I've been a nurse for 40 years, mostly emergency nursing, but I've spent the last 20 years facilitating learning with simulation. I'm a past president of the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, also known as INAXL, and I'm currently on the board of the directors for the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And my passions really are um, facilitator development and evaluation of simulation and clinical learning environments. So let me just tell you a little bit about our Sim Center. We're a freestanding hospital-based Sim Center designed to meet the learning needs of the government healthcare system, which includes 15 hospitals, 50 clinics, ambulance services, and home health services. Our four floors align with skills, OSCEs, patient care and operating theaters, and the surgical skills lab. When I arrived in 2019, there wasn't even a chair in the building. So we've come a long way since then. Now we have an abundance of various types of mannequins, virtual reality machines, and task trainers. Our surgical skills lab is equipped for cadavers, animals, and training for da Vinci robotic surgery. What we don't have an abundance of is staff. However, this past year, we have supported almost 600 course sessions and have had almost 14,000 learners participate in courses. We remained open throughout the pandemic. Now let's move on to debriefing. Now we use debriefing to help learners connect what has happened in the simulation with their clinical practice, with the goal of improving safe patient care. Now, debriefing is an acquired skill, and it takes a lot of practice. And many experts will tell you that they're still uncomfortable with debriefing because it is so important. So in this session, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll share with you why we believe debriefing is so valuable, explain the general types of debriefing models and their phases, but debriefing is a vast topic Simulation books all have a separate chapter discussing it, and some books focus entirely on debriefing. So this will really just be an overview of the topic. So first of all, what is debriefing? And what is the role of the facilitator? Well, this activity usually takes place after the scenario ends, though sometimes reflective pauses or debriefings can occur during a scenario. Debriefing is conducted by a facilitator who's trained in debriefing methods and who observed the entire scenario. Now the debriefer must create a psychologically safe environment for guiding this reflective conversation so that participants can share their feelings and talk through their strengths and weaknesses. It's also the facilitator's responsibility to engage all of the learners and hear everyone's thoughts. A major goal of debriefing <clears throat> is to promote reflective thinking, but with guidance. So reflection encourages the learner to think back on the experience they just participated in, to identify and explore what went well and what didn't go well. The debriefer asks questions in a way that encourages this reflection, and that leads to new knowledge and perspectives that are then combined with prior knowledge. Now, during debriefing, we can identify knowledge gaps. We can link theory or what has learned, been learned in the classroom to the practice or patient care environment by helping the learners connect their thoughts, beliefs, and actions. Debriefing then helps the learners to transfer what they've learned to the clinical environment where they can implement new understandings or skills to improve patient care. Now the Healthcare Simulation Standards of Best Practice published by the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning were first developed over a decade ago. 
But just this fall, the fourth edition was published. Now, these standards provide evidence-based guidance in all aspects of simulation for all disciplines. And they're freely available and can be easily found on Google or through the INAXL website. Now, focusing on the debriefing standard, it has four criteria. There, but there are many required elements that align with each of these criterion. So I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Now, the first criterion stresses that the debriefing is planned and guides the learners to meet the learning objectives. The debrief should be preceded by a pre-briefing and a scenario. All of the experience should be at the level of the learner's ability and knowledge. The debriefing should consist of multiple phases, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Now, criteria two focuses on the fact that the debriefer needs to be competent in their role, as well as knowledgeable about the case or scenario. Ideally, the debriefer should have seen the entire scenario so that they know what to focus on in the debrief. And there has to be adequate time allotted for this debriefing. So in, if the scenario session looks like it's going to be running over, it's definitely preferable to stop the scenario early rather than to cut the debriefing short. And we use special types of questions to help the learners reflect, and I'll share more in a bit. Now, the debriefing uh, occurs in a location where privacy and confidentiality be can be maintained so that the learners can speak freely. You know, this is one aspect of providing psychological safety. The reflective conversation will focus on the learner's behaviors and actions and inactions. And that's scary for a lot of people to put themselves out there like that. So we have to have confidentiality in a safe environment. It's also um, important to have support available in case of unexpected stress. For example, I did a simulation where the elderly patient died expectedly, um, but it led to a very distraught student. What we learned was that her grandfather had died the day before. We didn't know that. We would have given her other options, but she needed support while the group carried on the simulation. So when you know you're going to have high risk situations, certainly when it involves the death of the simulator, it is important to have some um, assistance for that. Now the debriefing should be planned according to the complexity of the scenario, the level of the learner's knowledge and ability, the amount of time available, and the learning objectives. There are several phases designed to facilitate the analysis and reflection, as well as aid transfer to practice. At present, there are 17 recognized debriefing models. Although each model is different, there are general phases of a debriefing. Other than the introduction and closing, the main phases of a three-pronged model include reactions, analysis, and summary. These three stages, reactions, analysis, and summary, can be found in all debriefing models, but they might have different names. So we're going to discuss each of these as we move along. There's also some models that have four stages or even seven. So starting debriefing with an introduction allows learners to feel more comfortable and at ease. So first, thank them for their active participation and then remind them of the purpose of the debriefing. We should also remind them again that the activity is confidential and share the basic assumption, which they should have already heard in the pre-briefing. And that states, we believe that everyone participating in activities at our skills lab is intelligent, capable, cares about doing their best and wants to improve. And let the learners know what, what's expected of them during the debriefing in order to decrease their anxiety. Now the next phase is reactions. So during the simulation scenario, learners may have felt various emotions such as anxiety, anger, fear, frustration, and other emotions. 
or maybe they were elated and excited and, and giddy and had some more positive emotions. So asking them about their feelings will allow them to unpack those emotions and set them aside. It's really hard to learn when you're full of emotion, but don't let the learners continue that negativity path for very long before redirecting them back to the next phase. You might say something like, yes, I noticed that was not managed well also. Um, we'll come back to that and we'll discuss it in a few minutes. After releasing their emotions, the next phase will focus on analysis and understanding of their simulation experience. The analysis phase focuses on using guided reflection to help the learners critically reflect on their performance. And one goal is to help the learners to meet the objectives of the simulation. Discussions are based on the observations by the facilitators and the peers on the learner's actions and behaviors during the simulation. In this phase, debriefers focus on the learner's perspectives and thought processes to identify performance gaps and allow critical reflection. Now, I've mentioned the word reflection a few times now, so time to define it. Reflection is a technique. It's used to help learners examine what happened in the scenario as well as why it happened. This is, can also be referred to as reflection on action or reflection after action. And this process requires critical thinking because the learners have to process why they chose the actions they did or figure out why they didn't act when they should have, especially if they knew they should have. As a result of helping the learners to develop their ability to reflect, we can also impact clinical practice as learners take this skill into the workplace. Sometimes people use the words debriefing and feedback interchangeably, but they really are two different concepts. So debriefing is facilitated by a person trained in debriefing methods, while providing feedback is often done by an instructor or a peer. Now, during debriefing, the facilitator encourages the learners to discuss and reflect on their actions. What was happening when you decided to give that medication? Or tell me what you were thinking when Kim responded to the patient's spouse. This is the reason why debriefing session timings are longer than a simulation scenario. We have to take the time to help the learners put the activity into context and to ensure that any errors in action or thinking are corrected. Providing feedback is primarily giving information back to the learners and focusing on their performance. So you might say, you missed the second step in cleaning the IV site, or I noticed you broke sterile technique, but you kept going. Now giving feedback usually does not allow the learners to reflect on their actions as the instructor just tells them what they did well and what they didn't. Now, feedback should be constructive and not punitive. And it's most commonly used when teaching psychomotor skills, like how to start an IV or how to give an injection. But feedback is also a part of debriefing. Now, to start the analysis phase, ask the learners to describe what happened. This will establish if all the learners understood what was happening in the scenario in the same way. For example, what happened to this patient? Or what was this scenario all about? Now, when learners have different roles in a scenario, they don't always remember the situation in the same way. So if one person is the primary physician and another is responsible for inserting a central line, they will have two very different memories and perspectives on the care of the patient. Here is when the facilitator can make sure that everybody knows the big picture or the overall situation. And after that, then the detailed analysis can start. Now, during this phase, the facilitator may use different forms of questions. And these questions are designed specifically to help the learners to think and to reflect. One method is Socratic questioning. With this technique, the facilitator asks the learners open-ended questions 
to uncover their thought process and develop a deeper awareness of their performance gaps. Form questions that make the learners think back on the situation. This thinking back, well, that's reflection. For example, I saw that you took the temperature orally. Tell me why you decided to use that route. Another way to ask questions is using the advocacy inquiry model. These types of questions offer your observations and then ask for clarifications from the learners. These take a little practice to become comfortable with. Now, the first step is preview, where you state what you'd like to talk about. So for example, I'd like to talk about what happened when the patient complained of pain. In the advocacy one step, you offer your observation objectively. And you could say, when the patient complained of abdominal pain, I saw that you continued your assessment of his range of motion. This is followed by advocacy too, or your perspective on the impact of the behavior. In this case, it could be, I think that the patient's pain should have been addressed as a priority. Next, we inquire by wondering what was on the learner's mind. So for example, I wonder what you were thinking at that time. Then listen very carefully to understand the learner's reflection on what happened. And be sure to include discussion on the successful aspects of the simulation and not just the negative. A question like, tell me what went right and why can lead the learners to identify performance strengths. But it will also tell you if the learner understands why they were successful or not. Sometimes learners do all the right things, but they have no idea why. And many debriefers like to begin by focusing on the positive in order to help build that psychologically safe environment. Others prefer to follow the order of the scenario and debrief in chronological order. This is also the time to clarify the rationale of their actions. You also might find that the learners do the wrong things, prioritize incorrectly, use poor judgment, but their logic kind of makes sense. So then you need to ask follow-up questions to help find the cause for where they went wrong and to clarify their misunderstanding. Now, closing the performance gaps is a part of the analysis. If the learners cannot answer the debriefer's questions, then the debriefer should close the gap, but only after allowing adequate time for the learner to think about their response and formulate the answer. You know, we're terrible at waiting in silence, terrible. But remember, these, these people are learning. They need time to think about your question. Then they have to sort through the information in, your brain, in their brain, reflect back on their performance, find the moment in time that you're talking about, and then they can think about their answer and respond. But to make it more challenging, for example, where I live, 93% of the people are expats. So it's likely that the person will be translating the question to their primary language and then back to the language of the debriefing. And this takes additional time. So silence is really uncomfortable, but it's necessary to allow them time to think and process. Only after you've given them time should you close the gap, or maybe you should ask the question another way that's clearer. It's always preferable to clarify what they already know instead of giving them the answer or telling them what they should do. Now, to ensure that uh, learning took place, the debriefer could verify by asking, if you had to do it again, what would you do differently? And keep in mind all the gaps of performance that were brought up and debriefed. Then just keep asking anything else until all the points are covered. Then after the analysis, the debriefing session moves to the summary. Before concluding the debriefing session, ask the learners what they have learned or the take home messages of the simulation experience. If they need to do additional activities to better meet the learning objectives, provide options for that. For example, 
you might say, you would benefit from reviewing the algorithm for basic life support so that you're more comfortable the next time you have a code situation. Please do that prior to the end of the week and then respond to any questions they still have. And lastly, close the debriefing session by thanking the learners for their participation and reassuring their confidentiality. Then say, I hope this simulation experience will be helpful in your future practice. And that will remind them of the purpose of the simulation by adapting what they've learned to their clinical environment. Ask what their key takeaway is from the activity and how they'll apply that in clinical practice. I'd like to now show you a series of videos so that you can see debriefing in action. But remember that debriefing should be preceded by a pre-briefing that sets the stage for the scenario. In order to understand the scenario, the stage needs to be set in the pre-briefing. So while you watch this video, I'd like you to identify some of the important things the facilitator did in order to create psychological safety, as well as to prepare the learners for what was to come. Hello everyone, and welcome to ITCAN Clinical Simulation and Innovation Center. I am Guillaume, and I will be your facilitator for today. I want to start the pre-briefing by sharing information about what you can expect to its day simulation. The whole purpose is to improve patient <coughs> safety and outcomes. We will discuss information about the scenario and then I will show you the room, simulator, and equipment. After that, I will tell you about your patient, what you are expected to do, and then when you have completed the patient care, we will come back together for the PV, okay. which is a time to reflect on the scenario, discuss what went well and what didn't, then how we will apply that to our patient care. I want to share with you the basic assumption of simulation. We believe that everyone participating in activities at Hamad Medical Corporation is intelligent, capable, cares about doing their best, and wants to improve. Therefore, we hope you will fully participate in this learning activity. I want you to be actively engaged for the sake of learning. So we will make sure that you understand the expectations before we start. The most important thing to know is that we expect you to make mistakes today. That is how we learn. But we also ask that everyone maintain confidentiality about simulation experience by not sharing information about the scenario or your peers' performance. We want to create an environment where everyone feels safe to discuss what they don't know mistakes they make, and ideas for how to do better. This is the video consent and confidentiality form. Kindly complete and return it to me. Okay, so now let's review the objectives of this session. During the simulation, do you need to be able to, number one, Perform LOC and ABC assessment correctly. Number two, demonstrate the use of pain assessment tool effectively. And number three, demonstrate correct patient handover using ISBOR. Okay, I think so. Do you have any questions for me? No. No. Okay. The simulation will be inside the patient room and will last for five minutes, followed by 15 minutes of debriefing here in the debrief room. So let's proceed to the simulation room and I will give you an orientation. Thank okay, you, sir. Sir. Thank you. This is the simulation room. As you can see, the setup is a patient room. You have the vital signs monitor on the wall, which you can use. An IV fluid attached to the mannequin. The sink where you can do your hand washing. An operational hospital bed and the oxygen therapy supplies to connect to an oxygen outlet and turn it on. Are you all familiar to how 
safe to use all of these. Yes, sir. Do you have any questions at this point? No. No. So let me introduce you now to the mannequin. This is Hal, one of our high fidelity mannequins here in Itcar. You can attach the vital size monitor and the results will reflect on this screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can position him and administer oxygen if needed. Mm -hmm. There will be a voice coming out from him to answer if you have any questions. He has palpable pulses and lung sounds, so you can ask with him. If there's a need for you to call the physician, please use the telephone. I will be inside the control room and will be observing you. This session will be video recorded and will be used only for debriefing purposes. Hence the consent form that you have completed a while ago. Ms. Kolud is a simulated participant and will be the patient's wife. Do you have any questions at this point? No. no. Now let me give you an overview of the scenario. The patient you will care for is Mr. Ali Rahim, a 65-year-old male admitted yesterday due to chest pain. He is hypertensive and diabetic and currently taking insulin and amlodipine as maintenance medications. He has a wife, but she is not currently inside the room. Okay. Your objectives perform LOC and ABC assessment, mm -hmm. demonstrate the use of pain assessment tool, and demonstrate correct patient handover. You can see Mr. Ali lying on the bed in the low fowler's position mm -hmm. when you enter the room. He appears to be in distress, holding his chest, and has an IV running at KVO. Your scenario will begin from there. RD will be the primary nurse who will do the initial assessment and Baha will be the secondary nurse and will assist RD in managing the patient. I hope everything is clear. Do you have any questions? No. no. Now I'll show you a short video of the scenario and you can use that and I'll use that as the foundation for the debriefing. So be sure to watch for the behaviors, the actions and inactions of the learners so that you'll be able to comment during the debriefing session. Now the patient's voice is muffled and I wasn't able to caption the video. So I'll share with you that the patient reports that he's really not feeling well and that he's having chest pain now, and he wonders if that's normal. He says it feels like someone is sitting on his chest, and the discomfort started after he went to the toilet. When the nurse asks more questions, the patient responds angrily, stating, I told you I'm in pain. You're asking so many questions of me. Now, too much pain. Call doctor. Call the doctor. So let's watch and see how did the novice nurse handle this situation. Good morning, Mr. Ali. How are you? How's your day? Good morning. Good morning. I'm not very well today. Can you tell me how you're feeling today? Doctor, I'm having a chest pain now. I'm not sure if this is normal. Okay, Mr. Ali, we will go, we will do some few checks on you. Uh, but how can you just take a better side? Okay. Patient? Can you tell me how's your breathing now? Oh, okay. So we will just position you. How's that? This okay? Doctor, I went to the toilet and after that, I started to feel some discomfort. Okay, we will just, uh, I'm going to give you some oxygen that will help you breathe, okay? Okay, well, just let me add that uh, if you have pressure cup in your hand. Okay, check your hand pressure. Okay, I will just uh, place this one also in your one of your fingers so that we can check the oxygen level, okay? Thank 
Can I own a check or keep a check yourself in your mouth, please? Yes, uh, the blood pressure is 100 over 60. The respiratory rate is 24. The uh, heart rate is 67. And the SPO2 is uh, 95 with oxygen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ali, you told me that you just came from the bathroom a while ago that you had the chest discomfort. Can I ask you one, one question now? What makes the pain better or worse? I told you I need a pain. You are asking so many questions for me. Okay, uh, we will. Uh, we need to ask you more questions so that I can know how can we help you. Okay. Okay, Mister Ali, can you just describe to me the pain? Uh, madam, Madam, calm down, please. We are helping your husband now. Okay, just tell me just the outside. 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 Just stay outside. Just go 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 outside. أنا بتكلم مع نرجع دكتور حالة لازم تهتم في زوجي معلش معلش لا لازم تهتم في زوجي أوكي معلش معلش دكتور بشارة how are you doing yeah yeah this yeah this is Maha speaking دكتور بشارة could you please come to the room on O seven we have a patient who has a severe chest pain and we need you here please we're gonna tell you everything when you arrive Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. RD, I already asked the doctor to come. Okay, thank you, Baha. You're welcome. Now, I'm going to debrief the two nursing students following their scenario. This is not a comprehensive debriefing for the sake of time. Um, however, many key points were addressed. There was a lot to talk about following this scenario. Um, so I want you to think about as you watch, what's missing from the debriefing? Um, how well do I create a psychologically safe environment? What other areas of the, or aspects of the scenario could I covered? Let's take a watch. Hi, Ari and Baha. Thank you for participating in this scenario. And now we're here for the debriefing. So we'll just take a few minutes and we'll go over the scenario itself and some of the, the details of that patient's care. I just want to remind you of the basic assumption that we have here at the Sim Center that everybody is smart, intelligent, is here to learn, and is capable. So we want you to be able to talk honestly and openly about what went well, what didn't go so well, because we all know we learn more from the mistakes we make than when we do everything right. So tell me, um, after the scenario, you know, how are you feeling after the scenario? Baba? Um, I don't know. It was very stressful. Like, very stressful? Yeah, it was stressful for me. It was a lot of distractions, so I didn't really, I didn't figure it. So it doesn't go, it didn't go as what I was like hoping to. And so there were a lot of distractions that made you feel stressed out, mm -hmm. and it didn't go the way that you thought it would. Yes. In what way didn't it go how you thought? Um, because you know I wasn't like um, even that I know that the supply of the patient would be coming like. Uh, uh, to check for her husband, but I uh, would like expect it to be like uh, uh, asking um, like loudly and uh, uh, maybe because also I know her language, she was speaking Arabic also the same language, so it was like really stressful. So um, I didn't focus like okay. 
So the distraction of the wife took away your ability to focus on the patient care. Yes, I right. also like uh, take a while for me to to go back to think about the patient of some depravity and uh, the assessment interventions. Okay, so really threw you off. <laughs> How about you, Artie? How did you feel after the scenario? Um, after me, I, I felt frustrated uh, because at the back of my mind, before we started the scenario, I had this structure already on how to manage the patient. So the problem is that uh, when I went there, uh, there are some uh, discussions that caught me off guard. Uh, wherein, but the, the thing that I realize now is that the main focus should always be the patient. So that's the thing. I felt like I did not do well okay. uh, with this uh, scenario because I should have managed the patient faster okay. as, as expected. All right. So you were also distracted then by the wife and, and the activities going on around you. And, but you knew what you wanted to do. You knew what you yeah. needed to do. You just couldn't quite get there um, because of what was going on around you. Good, good. So I'm hearing a lot about distractions. All right. Um, so what was this scenario about? Can you just give me a short summary? Yeah, it's like a patient with the uh, chest pain. So he put in the, uh, um, the ABC system mm -hmm. and also uh, communicate with the, uh, uh, with the physician to call the, uh, the doctor to come and see the patient. Okay, so a good assessment and then call the doctor. And have you had that experience in clinical? I know that you're both new nursing students. Have you had that experience in clinical yet? Yes, I do have this experience like one or two times, but uh, I wasn't like really involved. So I was just only like kind of observing what's happening. Okay. But it's really different when you are like the nurse. You are the one that we're gonna take, or we should have to take the action yes. rather than just observe. That's really big difference. It, yes, I agree with you. It is a big difference when you're put in that position of having to be the nurse. Yeah. And but that's the beauty of simulation, right? Is there are a lot of things in clinical that you can't do because you're not licensed, but in simulation, you get to be the nurse. What else do you did you notice that, that you think the scenario was about? Uh, like what I mentioned already, uh, the thing is that uh, the patient is having chest pain, and he explained to us, he narrated to us uh, how the chest pain started, and then supposed to be we go to assess and call the doctor, but it felt like there's a delay from the side because of. Uh, incomplete assessment from our side. Okay, all right. So we have agreement that it, it was about assessment and it was about communicating with the healthcare provider, but communicating with the wife got in the way. Uh, yes. Didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. So tell me, um, Artie and, and Baha, what are some things that you feel like you managed well in this scenario? Um, uh, so it's more of, I started with communicating directly with the patient. Uh, I believe I showed compassionate care. I tried to talk to the patient and get uh, uh, more uh, pertinent data uh, on how to, so that we can, we know how to manage this patient. So communication with the patient, uh, we felt that, uh, uh, that there is uh, there's something good there. Um, delegation, but I felt like the delegation is too much for my partner. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you do you agree with that, yes. partner? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, um, because I'm the secondary nurse, that was like a bit uh, some pressure because you know, like dealing with the uh, um, with the, with the wife, the patient, mm -hmm. because I don't have like much much like information on the patient, like the uh, like RD was a primary nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, went, I don't know, like, should I talk to the patient because she was to the family, to the wife, because she was asking about the, uh, what's happening to her husband. And also, um, second thing, when asking to, uh, to go and to call the doctor, 
Um, no, that, <laughs> that was the first yeah, I didn't thing. work so well, did it? Yeah, because I really, I don't know, like, I feel hardly he's the one should call the Okay. Person. Okay, well, that's interesting because I noticed that when you called the doctor, you didn't have any information to give him, and you told him you would tell him more when he got there, right? So, was what was your thinking behind that conversation? Um, like, again, stress. So, the stress. Yes, the yeah. stress, because, you know, like, I just did a doctor to come, like, as soon as possible, and... Uh, Somebody come help me, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And, and I'm also hearing you say that you didn't believe you were the correct one to make that phone call. So tell me more about why you believe that call should have been made by Artie. Yes, because uh, he's the one who knows more about the patient. Okay. Like, uh, because the doctor asked me about the patient history, who is this patient? Because she told me the first question, she said, okay, um, I do have like uh, uh, another like 10 or 15 patients, I'm taking copy of the whole, like the whole unit. So tell me more about who is this patient, so I can't be prepared. Okay. Because she said, I might give like a verbal order to give them, tell me more about it, like uh, But really, I, I did not, I don't know, like, um, I wasn't really happy. Then I was just when I, after I hung on the phone. Sure. Like, oh my God, what did I do? What have I done? What have I done? How do, you, how do you feel about that? Do you, do you believe that Baha was the right one to make the call? Or do you feel that you should have made the call? It felt to me that I be the one. Because uh, I was a primary nurse, I had uh, uh, more information about the patient. Um, Baha, because uh, Baha was assisting me, I am the one who spoke to the patient. Um, the thought that crossed my mind uh, uh, in the scenarios that I cannot treat the patient, but I should have realized also that I can endorse the patient to Baha and I can be the one who will call the doctor and give more information so that when the doctor will come, then everything, the treatment should be quick. Do you, um, do you think there's anything the doctor might have ordered for your patient had the doctor known all of the information in the report over the phone? Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. If you allow me, like, um, it's all based on the information. So if I like, follow the, the what, what we've been taught, like in the in the university, um, then I'm gonna provide like more detailed information for the for communication tools. So for sure, the doctor will ask for um, ACG, for the ECG, and uh, like, um, any painkiller. Um, she okay. might ask like to give any particular tip on fear and medication in order for the patient or not. So yeah. yeah. Yes, I agree too. I think that you know if we're able to give all that information, we can start to give proper orders, right? But if we're if we don't, then we're basically delaying our patient's care, right? One of the other things I noticed. Um, that so when your patient complained of pain, some of the responses were <clears throat> that already you had asked him what makes the pain better or worse, and he got angry when you asked him that. And the wife came in, um, and he started having more pain, and he was told to relax and take deep breaths. So I'm wondering, in hindsight, is there a different way that you might have addressed his pain? Uh, I was thinking, because uh, the thought that is around in my mind a while ago is that I'd like to gather more information okay. to know how to treat the pain <clears throat> so that later on when we were going to report to the doctor, uh, because it was thought to us that uh, using the pain scale is a way for us to know if this is a heart problem or a respiratory problem, so that we we'll know more. But uh, since uh, it also crossed our mind a while ago that probably that when the wife came in, his anxiety probably increased because of the presence of the wife. And Mine then, did, and yeah. I was just observing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then probably because of that scene itself that it 
different like the, the patient are being the, the patient's condition. So it probably we could have managed uh, like going uh, with the wife outside or asking somebody to talk with the wife and explain the problem probably we can concentrate more with the patient. Okay. Excellent. Um so I think that you've done a, a good job of identifying um your your strengths, right? As well as some areas that, that need a little bit of improvement, but that will come with practice, right? You'll get more opportunities to assess patients with pain, more opportunities to manage families, and more opportunities to communicate with physicians. So um, Baha, what's one takeaway um, from this experience that you'll be able to apply in your next clinical rotation? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. So first of all, um, like theory, we have been taught like in the classroom, um, it's a little bit different than the post study in our okay. situation. Like an even, <laughs> even it's, a, it's a simulation and the semantics but it's still very stressful. I think guys, we did it like in a very good way. So we thought like it's a really patient will die like in a minute. Um, this is number one. Number two, um, I do believe like now I figured out I have um, like um, I have I identified as a gap like myself like uh, okay. um, like um, I should be managed just as so I have to be managed the I have to be able to um, to uh, to manage my my uh, level of stress so okay. otherwise you know I can't function like um, number two um, like with, even with I try myself like even with any kind of stress I have to get the right information you have to be focused and, but as we said that will, will come with time so yeah. I wish I wish that would not take too much time for my for me to to be able to work. it does take time that's why you're in school for as long as you are. Yes. Um, so that you have time to practice all of these things and, and provide safe patient care. So one of the things that I would like you to do um, after you, after we're finished here today is to think about that stress that you experienced and identify one or two ways that you think that you could manage that stress in the moment. You know, do you need to step back and count to three okay. as you refocus yourself? Okay. Do you need to <clears throat> make sure to get help from your peer um, so that you can focus back on the patient? So that, that's a takeaway that I would like to give you <clears throat> in order to um, help you for the next one. Okay. So, Ari, what's time. your biggest takeaway? For me, is that I should not delay. Okay. Yes. Uh, I should be very quick with the assessment because that was a life threatening condition. So, in order for us uh, to prevent that the patient will deteriorate, we should be very quick with the assessment, ask the right questions, communicate better with the patient, and of course, with uh, right at least. So, if they will understand what's going on, they will be more cooperative. And then, uh, yes, uh, communication among the people of us. I think we can do it directionally. I keep on giving. I noticed uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just delegating that uh, I thought that, that I can do it. So, probably uh, self awareness on how to uh, manage this patient. What kind of techniques do you think you could use in order to make that difference for next time? Well, uh, probably uh, uh, my partner and I. Uh, we are going to do this uh, scenario again so that we talk more. Okay. Uh, I should have like a, a clear description and then he, he can have a feedback that he got the message correctly. Good. Yeah. Good. And then um, I should think also clearly, uh, even though there are distractions, because this the distraction can happen even in a hospital setting. So I should be ready for that. So I should be fun. I know it is a stressful environment, but we should be trained in a way that we can handle these things. Sure. I will call the doctor. I'd like you not to worry too much about the speed with which you did your assessment because remember in this beginning course, it's about learning assessment, right? 
And so we're teaching you to be methodical and you're right, your patient could have a life-threatening um, problem creating this chest pain. It could also be from anxiety. It could be from a variety of different things. That, but if you become proficient at that systematic A, B, C, D, E assessment and are able to keep focused on it, then um, that's something I would like to see you work on as well in the coming weeks. So, all right. Um, any questions for me? I think you guys did uh, a fine job today. Thank so and much. thank, thank you, you for participating in the debriefing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So um, I'm sure you noticed that we didn't cover everything. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my staff, Artie, who is uh, one of my educators, and Baja, who is one of my operations specialists, who also has an education background in simulation. I will tell you, this is not their normal performance. So uh, these videos were created for a, a workshop we're teaching where we want people to identify what didn't go well with uh, what we've done. So uh, a few things I want to mention. So first of all, did you notice the papers in my hand? It's perfectly acceptable to keep notes during the scenario and then to use those notes to guide the debriefing. And I also encourage you to use a template so that you don't forget anything important. So you can see the white paper in my hand is actually our template that we use for um, pearls, which is the most common form of debriefing that we use at our center. So we script it all out and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. As people get more comfortable and confident debriefing, they'll start to make it their own. But if they don't do it very often, they're going to need the, the prompts and cues. We also, obviously we video recorded the scenario, but I didn't use it during the debriefing. So just a couple comments about video debriefing. Um, some people will take the video and have the learners watch the entire video again during the debriefing, which I think is not the best use of time. I think you mark the areas that are most important to talk about. And you may have an audio visual system that allows you to do that. It's just a clicker. And then when you're ready, it opens right at the points that you want it to. Or you can jot down the timing on the video. But I really encourage you to be judicious in its use. So in the four minute scenario that we used, I would probably pick out one, maybe two of the, the things that we needed to talk about and, sh and show those clips during the debriefing. But I also encourage you to, to show them the good things that they do. Um, you'll notice that we had some laughing in our scenario. I think the use of humor is perfectly fine. It um, does a great job of decreasing the tension and the stress in the room. And it kind of humanizes the debriefer um, when they're working with the students. Of course, it goes without saying that the humor needs to be appropriate. Uh, you'll notice the length of the scenario. It actually was about four times the length of the video that we sh showed you of the scenario. And so that was a four minute scenario. And I think the debriefing was, yeah, it was 17 and a half minutes. And we didn't even cover half of what we could have covered. So, you know, as you're doing your planning, you need to keep in mind that the debriefing um, can take quite a long time. And then if you're doing uh, interprofessional education simulation, you'll wanna make sure that you have somebody from every discipline involved in the debriefing, in the planning, in the development. So um, you can't or you shouldn't do IPE with just one of the disciplines being responsible for everything. It should be a, a group effort. 
All right, so how do we know if we're effective debriefers? There is a tool, it's called the Debriefing Assessment for Simulation in Healthcare, or the DASH tool, and it's used to evaluate the debriefing experience after the simulation. It provides a helpful guide for facilitators just to ensure that they're adhering to best practice standards. Now there's three versions and in many languages. The Rader version can be used by a peer um, to evaluate the debriefer. The student version is a way for the learners to evaluate the debriefer. And the instructor version is for the debriefer to do a self-assessment. So the DASH tool has six elements that are essential to, an effect, to be an effective debriefer. And these include establishing an engaging learning environment, maintaining an engaging learning environment, providing an organized and structured way of debriefing, promote, provoking engaging discussions, identifying and exploring performance gaps, and helping learners achieve or sustain good practice. So these are all things that were covered in the um, discussion of the various phases of debriefing. But again, not everybody is a skilled debriefer. It takes constant practice. Um, it, it is just a big key to the achieving mastery. And I personally think the hardest part is learning how to ask the questions um, in a way that creates reflective behavior. So that is the end of my presentation. My contact information is here on the slide and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have after the presentation. And um, also have references, but they're going to be pretty small for you to see, but I'm also happy to send them to um, anybody who, who asks. So, all right, thank you for your participation in this presentation and I appreciate your time. Thank you.